Santa Clara, California, is the Cassandra Summit uh, Live. We're here with the co-founder of Datastax, uh, Matt. Welcome to uh, the Cube again. Uh, congratulations. Thanks You're for having me. You're the co-founder, right? I am the co-founder. Co Unless they uh, took that away somehow. Do you actually go through the code base and, and look at you know all the code? I have or? not looked at that code in a very long time. <laughs> I spend most of my time these days with customers figuring out what their needs are and how to make them more successful. Okay, we're here with Jeff Kelly, our lead analyst at Wikibon.org, our research team at SiliconANGLE. Um, so we can be technical, but we'll be like a helicopter, go up and down, because sure. really what we want to do is we've had a lot of geek conversations. We talked with uh, Jonathan to give a keynote. We had Adrian on from Netflix talking about his demo. Um, so let's do some, let's range on that. But really the, the number one thing that we find in the marketplace that people are kind of scratching their heads on who want some signal um, is the noise around Cassandra's not relevant, um, Hadoop's one, Mongo's better for this. So you go on Quora, you go on the threads, you, depending on who you talk to and what school they went to, or what language they write in, they like this or didn't have the documentation, had a bad experience with this, loved it here, hated it here. It's a lot of noise. Yes, there is. Help us, one trip away that noise and talk about Cassandra, why it's relevant today, where's the traction on it, and where's it going, and then we'll get into some of the specifics. Sounds like a good thing. So, first of all, the traction that we've seen with Cassandra is really when companies want to build their business on top of a platform that not only scales, but will not fail, and they can legitimately trust their information with it to run the business. So we see a lot of interest in the Fortune 500. We see a lot of interest where people are moving off traditional relational databases like Oracles because they don't scale as well. And we've just found that as our sweet spot at this point. So you know, if you look at the lineup here today, we've got companies everywhere from Disney to the Netflixes of the world, uh, and they're just talking more and more about how they can use this. The theme that I've been hearing is that production is a key buzzword. So both on the positive and negative. On the, on the historical sense, there's been a lot of dings on quote the Quora's of the world, and I bring up Quora because I was just reading it again last night. Um, oh, I tried it in production, it didn't work, but then yet, there's a huge traction on the numbers in production, yep. right? And more than others. When I say production, I mean like, high availability, scalable, multiple data centers, I'm running a real business, not some prototype app. Yep. Is that true? Absolutely. I think that... Drill, drill uh, down on that, explain. I, I would even go a step farther and say, uh, we might not have even the most production deployments out there, but I bet you we have the most production deployments of people with their core business on this technology. I think that Cassandra is really, really good at staying up and running. It's really, really good at scaling and it's really, really good at performance on top of that. And when you look at those features combined, and someone's going to bet the farm of saying, you know, if, if this technology goes down, I legitimately lose revenue, you want to make sure you trust it. And we, you know, go talk to the guys around here today and you see a lot of that scenario. So Matt, let me ask you a question more, kind of change gears, we'll come back to that, because I, I want to have a couple more questions that come back to Strata, the original Strata conference, had some conversations with folks. That's when Hadoop kind of made its move. We talk about Cassandra, Mongo, HBase and Hadoop kind of as NASCAR. Someone's in the lead, someone drafts, slingshot around the next turn, so it kind of is like that. But let's first, before we go there, what's the personality of the Cassandra environment, the ecosystem and the community? How the would you personality yeah. of the ecosystem. I mean, um, everyone I mean, every community has a personality. Uh, you know, alpha geek, problem solvers. We heard uh, John say they're problem solvers. Expand on that and explain to the folks what is the kind of the personality of the, of the group. Besides I, being beer drinkers, we know that for a fact. There's some whiskey and vodka drinkers in there too. <laughs> I think that the personality of our community are realists who are smart and know how to pick a tool that is right for the job. They want something that's not fluff. They don't want to do extra work than is what is needed. They don't want to do things just because it's cool. They say, I have legitimate real world problems and I want a tool that's going to make my life and as a result my company's life significantly better. So very practical, very smart, hardworking people. That's interesting, because that's the practical is the same term Jonathan used, and as, a, as opposed to kind of the more academic or, or theoretical uh, approach, which, you know, you create some really cool technology, but how do you translate that into, into doing just what you guys are doing, which is supporting production level environments, people running their business on this, and you can't do that if you're, you know, you've got your focus more on the theoretical, hey, look what we can do, versus, hey, look what we can do and actually make it work. Right. Hey, you don't make a lot of money just by writing academic papers all day, unless you're <laughs> in academia. You know, we have, we have things that, we have specific problems that we hear from our users mm -hmm. that we solve so that their lives in that production environment are better. Let's lay out the horses on the track. Horses for courses. You know, people run better in the mud, in the grass, whatever the horse runs on. Um, Mongo, HBase, Cassandra, Couch, SimpleDB, Dynamo, whatever. Well, let's take the, the main ones, right? Mongo, HBase, Cassandra. Seem to be the, the top 
you know, couch, maybe, but I think those three is the most controversial in terms of ones that a lot of people are paying attention to, those three, uh, Mongo, HBase, and Cassandra. Break down the horses there. I mean, which one's better for which use cases? I mean, I'm not saying one's better than the other because we're hearing different use cases, right? HBase, you know, great for this, but don't try to put it here. Right. Mongo, great for here, but don't try to put it here. Is that true? Yeah, or is it just too early? If you go back you know, and look at the last 30 years, uh, we always try to cram every problem into one of probably five relational databases, right? You know, Oracle won that race with 11G for the most higher end uh, solutions, MySQL, MS SQL are around, Postgres, uh, but we crammed all of the data into one of those relational systems. Uh, it's, uh, uh, an easy analogy is, if you give me a nail and a screwdriver, I can get that nail into the wall. It might not be pretty, but I can make it work. Well, now we have a lot more tools in the chest. And so I do think that you know, that's a really good thing for technologists everywhere, because you can pick the right tool for the job. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think the areas where we see Cassandra really, really strive are, first and foremost, scalability, uh, especially when it matters on high availability and never going down. Uh, I think multi-data center is another close one. Uh, and then I believe that the third is honestly, as Jonathan said in his keynote this morning, anything involving time series data. But we see those three use cases, and I can't stress enough that that high availability of always being up and running is a really, really important one for us at there, whatever scale. There was a quote on uh, there's a quote on Core I want to read to you from a guy named Stephen Elliott. I don't know where he works, but it's a good quote. He goes, I would not place a huge amount of weight on any language or framework. This is about, you know, I want to get a NoSQL database. Uh, each person claims they specialize, and the truth is that any programmer worth their salt will be objective and experienced enough to pick the correct stack for the job. Um, I would say the best way to see how good a programmer's architecture really is is to ask him to sit and listen to what you're trying to do then recommend the proper stack and justify his reasons. Do you agree with that? Completely. Uh, I, th I remember when I was in school, uh, college, and I was learning how to program, you know, formally for the first time, uh, the, per, the language they taught us was C++. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, we were like, oh, okay, we're learning C++, and someone had the question of, well, what happens if I need a job that wants Java or PHP or whatever it is? And this was freshman CS 101. The professor said, if you can't pick up a new language in a matter of days or weeks, uh, we're not teaching you correctly. We're teaching you ideas. Languages yeah. are just methods to implement those ideas. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm a little bit older than you. We had to actually learn the data structures, but we had Pascal huh? the back in the day, but we had to actually do a lot of assembler. C was great. I mean, C was very efficient um, with memory and, and whatnot. But that brings the question back to Java. Java has been dinged. Even, um, compared to other languages, it's still faster, but you have that C++ Java crowd, right? Yep. So that also comes up in conversations. How do you talk about that distinction between the two? Obviously, Hadoop is Java-based, and you know, Bigtable was C++. I think that there are, and, and languages are not something I am an expert at, but uh, I, I, my programming days are behind me at this point. <laughs> but I will say that you know <laughs> there are strengths and benefits and weaknesses to both of those, right? Yeah. The C++ crowd has a lot more control on their hands, and they do get better performance but they have to worry about memory collection. And when you mess up, it's really bad for you. Yeah. Java doesn't have to worry about that. It's a much more efficient language for, because uh, you just completely ignore the responsibility of having to manage your own memory. So yeah, there are pluses and minuses to both. And again, it's, I think that that quote's really good where pick the right tool for the job. Yeah, and that really comes down to versatility in the skill set, right? So which is a whole other conversation. So let's go back to my experience at Strata, O'Reilly's first inaugural conference. We had theCUBE actually here at the Hyatt in Santa Clara. And, uh, um, I had a conversation with someone in the Cassandra community, their name I will not reveal, uh, our identity, you know, they probably, I was not authorized, but he was bullshit at the whole Hadoop thing. Oh, uh, the best solutions, not the best solutions. So, you know, historically, the best solutions don't always win. They usually don't. Usually don't. You know, look the at best technology look solutions at Microsoft don't DOS, win. that's my generation, it sucks, right? It's the worst operating system. Yeah, and then we've got Windows, and then thank God now Apple's out there, but, um, but you know, um, Mark, he's a Windows guy, so I could resist. Um, but no, but Cassandra has been known as kind of a, a core, well efficient. The documentation we've heard, you know, guys took some lumps for that, fixing it, um, making the tools better in the, in, the, in the GUIs, but was solid, but was being outmarketed by other environments. How are you guys responding to that? Um, obviously, it's not affecting the community, it's pretty solid here, but what, as someone who's a founder of Datastacks and in the community, what are you guys doing to kind of change the perception? Um, roadmap-wise, code-base-wise, contribution, 
Give us an update. I'm not saying those things are true, but I'm just saying that was kind of a sentiment of the, of the crowd then. So I, because Hadoop was being pumped up pretty heavily. And I'll say that, like, first of all, I think that Hadoop is complementary to Cassandra. You know, Hadoop's core is batch analytics. Cassandra's core is uh, very low latency, fast queries for online type scenarios. So again, those are not either, or not one or the other. They're very much, I should have both in my environment. Uh, with that said, uh, I think, I'm very, very happy with what we've done at Datastax as we've grown. You know, this is the third annual Cassandra Summit that we've now hosted. Uh, the first one was almost two years ago to the day. And there were 140 people there. There were over 400 last year. And there's somewhere, I haven't seen the latest count between 850 and 900 people here today, if not more. I just haven't seen the latest ticket counts. Uh, the community is growing a it's lot. It's a packed house. It's right? pretty packed. Yeah, it's packed. Um, we ran out of food. Uh, we got emails that said, Datastax employees do not eat any of the food. We had more people show up than we expected. Yeah. So they took away our lunch. Yeah, you got um, sushi, sushi bar over there. No, that's true, that's Spencer, true. Co-founder. So, <laughs> hey, well, every once in a while they let us splurge. Um, <laughs> with that said then, I think that one of the things that the Cassandra community, this is not DataStacks, but the community has been really disciplined at its importance, we're not trying, trying to be the best at everything. We are not trying to go a mile wide and a mile deep. It's impossible. Uh, we have really chosen some of the larger data, very important data set problems as the ones that we're going to focus on, and I think those results are speaking for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know the users and customers of our here today are giving great testimonials to why that's important to Talk them. Talk about those business. use cases real quick. Disney's in the other room talking about how they are building a data infrastructure as a service to the other teams so that each individual team no longer has to build and scale their own database. So they're building an internal service to power the rest of their business. Any other use cases that jump out at you production-wise that are uh, compelling that you can share publicly? Uh, that are spoken about here today, uh, going through my head on all the great presentations. Um, there's a great company that Matt Stump is the CTO of called Source Ninja, uh, where they were working on tracking every single open source uh, project for every single uh, uh, program that you've written. In other words, how do I make sure that every open source library that I'm using in my application is not only up to date, but if it's GPL, I know, so that I don't have to open source all my code. Companies are trusting their core businesses on this stuff. Uh, we see Eddie over there, MVP, <laughs> congratulations. He's kind of watching uh, the, the co-founder in action. I know Jeff wants to jump in, but I got to ask you uh, this next point, because it's really come out to us as a real differentiator for the Cassandra product and community as that is, and it's also affecting the marketplace in a big way, and that is solid state. Solid state is changing the game on yep. converged infrastructure, mainly because it's enabling uh, people with on-prem infrastructure to really start changing their own economics and performance yep. configurations, caching layers, you're seeing spinning disks, moves to backup, you're seeing, you're seeing tech guys, and, and as mentioned, Eddie and I were just talking earlier about creative architecture being re-architected, IO-centric infrastructure. Absolutely. Complete, and just in the past 12 months, within the enterprise. It's changing HP, Dell, and IBM's landscapes. Completely agree with it. So, so that's going on inside the enterprise, the data center, among other things, power and cooling, other stuff we track. And then externally in the big data world, in the cloud, you have massive tsunami of new apps. Greenfield or clean sheet of paper, stuff going on. Talk about the impact of solid state to one, uh, you guys, your data stack solution, Cassandra community, and then what's going on in the customer. Okay. So first and foremost, Everyone says SSDs are more expensive. And if you go by a pure cost basis, sure, yeah, an SSD yeah. drive for costs more per gigabyte. For a device. For a device. If it I costs put, more per gigabyte than a spinning media. Yeah. But it if does not cost a, if more. If you're doing a bill of materials for a device. Yes, it does not yes. cost more on a per IOP basis. A spinning disk can spin at most 250 times per second. Which means you get 250 requests well, out that, of that. Well, that's, that's if you don't factor in other things like taking away a SAN, million it, dollar SAN. Right, for and, and a, how much the yeah. cost of some SSD? Exactly. So this, the cost things we've debunked that. Okay, perfect. So we can move on. <laughs> okay. Uh, th uh, this, so, so this, I don't even know where we're going. Then that seems like the answer's here. No, I, mean, no, I want you SS to. I want you to give us some proof points. S you, SSDs in... make it truly linearly scalable between the hard drive, uh, or, or, or the storage medium, to the memory, to the CPU, where you can map a certain amount of CPU to each one of those other components, so that you can guarantee certain amounts of requests and do really, really good capacity planning uh, for databases. I mean, SSDs are like the silver bullet uh, for databases. Yeah, we heard Jonathan say that. Uh, but we, it's a good thing we're the reason why we're asking you is we want to get real third-party validation around our own uh, rhetoric and, and reporting and analysis, but we're really also trying to share with the customers impacts to their environments because what SSD is enabling on the converged infrastructure side is the same kind of 
uh, uh, disruption that's happening on the customer side, which is new thing, new way of doing things are now emerging. So for example, we've said in SiliconANGLE that you know, with, with big data, now new solutions can be argued that never thought of before because now instrumentation data from the business can be rendered in a dashboard. Yeah. So with converged infrastructure, the incumbents like Dell and HP and others sell servers. Yeah. And you know, you got Cisco out there and you got Juniper and Nasir are now part of VMware. And you got storage, EMC selling a <laughs> arrays, arrays, right? So that's the spinning disk. Fusion IO and, and uh, violin memory systems are disrupting the market with, with caching layers up and down the stack. So this is game changing. So game -changing. I'm trying to figure out for our, for our audience, what are the use cases? Who's taking advantage of this? What architecture, Cassandra or others, is best fit for that? I would say any application that's in an online setting should be using SSDs. It's that simple. If, because the real benefit of SSDs is you eliminate seeks, right? So I'm going to get 10,000 requests per second at a minimum per SSD with a latency of single digit milliseconds, right? Really fast. Uh, there is no worst case anymore. It's linear. It's, it is static. Use SSDs in any online scenario because A, you, you'll save money, which you already covered, and B, you get a better quality of service for your customer. Awesome. You take the guesswork out of it. All right, all right, Jeff, I didn't mean to hijack the whole interview. Oh. Go ahead. No, no worries at <laughs> all, well, Sean. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to dig in a little bit more. You're on the front lines talking to customers every day. So, uh, you know, one, wondering what you're hearing from customers in terms of, as we look forward, what Datastax and the Cassandra community is working on now. So what are some of the main uh, requests you're getting from customers saying, hey, we, we love Datastax, we love Cassandra, but we'd like to see X, Y, or Z. What are some of the, what are the next steps you guys need to take to kind of take this to the next level? So the big thing that's coming in Cassandra that's really exciting is, uh, it's and we're in, introducing virtual nodes in a new, in a near future, eh, in a near uh, future version, and that's in public. That's out there in trunk right now in the ASF. Mm -hmm. And what that'll do is that'll make uh, recovery time of node failures significantly better, and adding nodes to the cluster will be a lot better. So we're really working on rounding the edges of some of the operational things just to make the user experience that much better as they continue to grow. Because you know, obviously, the nature of any of these systems is you start with some nodes and you grow. Otherwise, mm -hmm. why would you use it? And so we want to make sure that that growing process is as seamless as possible. And so that's another step in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, there's some more information around collections that I heard about on a, the mailing list here that I need to dive into. Uh, and I just don't know enough about them at this point. But that group is moving forward really rapidly. And I think they're targeting an October release right now mm -hmm. uh, for the next version of Apache Cassandra. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk a little bit about security. We, you know, we're, we're uh, I noticed you guys uh, signed a deal with uh, Gazang recently. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we've been, I've been thinking about kind of security in the NoSQL world, and uh, there was a, a story in uh, Wired uh, last week or two weeks ago about a, a new company coming out of, uh, of the NSA that's talking about building, a, that mentioned the, that they kind of built cell level security into their NoSQL database. And how do you guys approach security? And how important is that to your customer base? Again, you're on the front lines. Is that, is, is security an issue that comes up, you know, point in the top two or three points uh, when you're talking to, to customers? Yeah, I, I, so a couple weeks ago I was on Wall Street and we're, we hear a lot about security questions and how would we accomplish X, Y, and Z, and our partnership with Gazang was a great step in that direction. Mm -hmm. So obviously for anyone that's in the Fortune you know, 1000, that's a bigger deal than the guys that are startups on Amazon today. They just yeah. haven't reached that aspect of their company's life yet that they have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. So it is something that comes up a lot and a lot, and obviously at Datasax we're working a lot with partners to uh, accomplish the things that customers need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. We, we talked a little bit earlier in the day about your kind of partner strategy, but maybe you could kind of articulate, I mean, where do you look, how do you decide where, when there's a, you know, a, a part of your platform that you need to partner on versus kind of uh, building uh, in conjunction with the community? I think that our strategy is we always think about the customer first, and we think about the user first, and we mm -hmm. think what's going to be best for them. And sometimes it makes sense because of the expertise that we have in house, that it's like, that's really core to the server, mm -hmm. and we should build that. There are other times where that's not something that we're necessarily experts at, and therefore, if we're not experts, it's really hard for us to build an extremely high quality product very quickly, and there might be other people out there that can do it better than us, and we can get that uh, end user satisfaction more quickly, mm -hmm. such as with Gazang. Mm -hmm. In that case, it was perfect sense. You know, Gazang's based out of Austin, we have a team in Austin, uh, there was a nice introduction there, and next thing you know, we've got this offering that we brought to market relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. So we look at each case on a sort of a, or each, thing on a case-by-case -case basis mm -hmm. to really find out how we can make the customer the most successful. That's interesting. So really focus on the core of what you do. If it's, if it's relatable to that, that's where you guys decide to invest internally versus find a partner for something that might be uh, more periphery, but you know, important, but not part of your core DNA. Exactly. Like we, It goes back to the earlier thing. We can't be experts at everything. We mm -hmm. just can't be. 
and if we try, we'll fail miserably at everything. Mm -hmm. So let's do the things we're really good at, but again, never sacrifice the customer experience. Good strategy. <laughs> never, it worked for Apple, right? Yeah, I was going to say, you, you never want to let the customer down. So, um, so finally, just in terms of, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing you know, all the, the different NoSQL databases out there, and John and I have talked today with guests about the horse race. Are, are, are we all, all those different NoSQL databases, are they all kind of, are we all racing to the same endpoint? Or is there, are we going to see uh, an environment develop where there are really different NoSQL databases for different purposes and it's not going to be a, a, a winner take all type of scenario? I really think if you say that there are destinations that are use cases, I think that there will be different winners for different use cases. I just don't know why we would go back again to having something that can be the best of everything. I just don't think it's possible because I think because there are options, why would you not choose the best thing? It's out there. Mm -hmm. there. There are companies focused on different things. There are projects focused on different use cases and as a result, you will get better natural results at some things than others. Mm -hmm. Matt, I want to talk to you about um, some, you mentioned when you were in school, obviously you were back in the days when they were teaching C++ as 101, which is good, it means you're, you have some chops, good computer science program. Um, but you're a little bit older like me, a little bit younger than me probably, but uh, we've been living in a decade <laughs> of, of great innovation where open source has created a lot of wealth creation and opportunities for entrepreneurs. The ability to stand up a venture from zero, uh, zero stage to prototype in market with validation is very little cost. The technology tax, when I did my first startup was, you know, I needed to spend $20,000 just, just for some gear in a data center, yep. in a closet, yeah. and a T1. You know, and I had to buy a sunbox, <laughs> I had to buy, it sucked. <laughs> I mean, it was hard. You got to go to the VCs and lay down and you know, take your punishment. Uh, but now, you know, we live, it's, it's all historic now, it's well documented. Um, but the lessons were learned. Twitter was started on, in the cloud, Zynga was started in the cloud. Hey, there's some MySQL <laughs> servers, jam up, throw some more, <laughs> scale up, throw some more RAM in there. But we heard you know, from Netflix that, you know, you have problems, right? You have scaling problems, things are breaking. Uh, I think Jonathan called it, uh, tech uh, liability or tech uh, uh, something. Technical it. debt. Technical debt, yeah, and which is true. But everyone wants, I'm not saying how do you avoid that, but you know, we're a learning culture. Entrepreneurs like to learn, developers seek information out. What would you say to the next generation of entrepreneurs who are using Node.js, for example, playing with Ruby, with Python, all these different tools, building apps, pumping stuff into the cloud, not thinking about what's downstream possibly. Is there things they could do now that we have learned that isn't a tax, that they could fundamentally from a computer science, entrepreneurial perspective do differently than before? Because uh, before it's simple, oh yeah, cheap gear, boom. I think Lamp stack up and running. What this has really enabled, and I think the cloud's actually a really big piece of this, because the cloud made it that there's no more CapEx, there's only OpEx. You can only program so fast, and languages will evolve and become higher levels so that that can move faster. You can procure hardware via the cloud in a matter of seconds. I don't think that the development game has changed. I think what this enables us to do is it enables the developer and the entrepreneur specifically to move quickly, and more importantly, you're going to fail, so fail fast and iterate off of that very, very quickly. And there's honestly no excuse not to do it these days because of how low the uh, entrance to the game is based on money. Like you don't need that much cash to start a company anymore. You just don't. So there's no reason to go take, not take that idea and run with it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You know, nine times out of 10, you will fail. Yeah, push the envelope. That's right, but go faster and it'll make the world as a whole a better place. We will see more innovation from more sources and as a result, uh, there will be more benefit to the average user like yourself and I. What is Cassandra's community doing to um, foster that creativity and to give someone comfort? Because you know, young kids will just throttle up because they don't know what's around the corner. They haven't crashed enough to know that it hurts. A little bit, right? But you know, obviously when you have failure, teamwork and community is always there. You know, one thing about Silicon Valley and the tech systems we lived in, especially Apache community has been, been known for this for years, is that you know, there's an honor among thieves, if you will, and use that metaphorically speaking, to, to help each other. Yep. So, so if you look at the Cassandra community, there's two angles to it. One is we're very open to accepting new people. You know, we, we acknowledge, I think, 17 MVPs today who've been building this community. And we are not there to drive an agenda, we're there to let them say this is what the community needs to do next. At the same time, you do need, you do need some defensive, hey, some, some adult supervision, as you might say. And Jonathan, at the top of the uh, Cassandra committers, is really good at saying, guys, I want to innovate, but we need to do so in a safe manner because we are a database, and if we break, that's the end of the game. We can't break. A database, first of all, stays up and running, and second of all, performs. So 
there's a nice uh, yin to the yang between sort of the guys guarding it, but at the same time accepting innovation from some of the guys that come in, so the community as a whole can grow and then foster faster growth. Great, all right, cool. Um, outlook for the next year. Um, what are you looking for for the next year? Just in life, in general, out looking forward. More of you guys at these great events. <laughs> yeah, we'll, be, well, we'll be at uh, Hadoop World in, in Strata, we're going to be at uh, VMworld, we're going to be at Intel Developer Forum, um, we're going to be doing a, a remote cube at Brocades, doing a big data center thing, so obviously we're, uh, we're covering a lot of converged infrastructure and big data is our sweet spots. Um, but we're ranging across, uh, well, I think, is there any other events I'm missing? I think you got them all for now, but I'm sure we'll add some more. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be on more red eyes. We love to go out into the field and talk to the smartest people we can find, <laughs> so, um, Matt, thanks for coming on theCUBE, I really thanks appreciate it. Uh, Matt, the co-founder of, so co founder of DataStax and uh, participant in the community. Um, great stuff here, great insight for entrepreneurs and just what's going on with Cassandra. We'll be right back with our next guest from Netflix right after this break.